the Spitfire, an undisputed icon of great British engineering and arguably one of the greatest success stories of the Second World War. Designed by R.J. Mitchell of the Supermarine Aviation Works, the Spitfire was built for both speed and agility, serving as a short-range interceptor fighter from its introduction in 1938 and throughout the war years. It went on to play a vital role in the Battle of Britain and together with the Hawker Hurricane was instrumental in keeping the nation's shores secure. However, as the Spitfire carved its place in history in the skies, Another example of British engineering prowess was making a name for itself on rails, the London and North Eastern Railway V2 Class 262. Built at the LNER's Doncaster and Darlington Works, the V2's versatility, power and turn of speed was severely put to the test during the Second World War, hauling long trains carrying goods, passengers, troops and even munitions and often exceeding their on-paper haulage capabilities. It was little wonder that the V2s became known as the engines that won the war. After the conflict and under the new British railways, the V2s continued to be used on both passenger and goods services. A handful even received double chimneys to further enhance their performance capabilities. Yet nothing lasts forever and all 184 were withdrawn between 1962 and 1966. Thankfully, the pioneer example, Green Arrow, was saved for the National Collection and can be currently found at the Danum Gallery and Museum in Doncaster. Welcome to Doncaster, birthplace of the LNER V2 class locomotive and the perfect setting for our next all new tooling announcement. Yep, we're here at the Dana Museum Gallery and Library, home of the National Railway Museum's V2 class locomotive Green Arrow, and just a stone's throw away from where it was built at the famous Doncaster Railway plant. Now it's not long since we added a new V2 to our Batten Branch Line range, Gary. That's correct. So what have we got today? Well, as people may know, we used to model a V2 in the Graham Farish range, which at the time was a real step change for N-scale modelling. But it's dated and models have come on a long way, so we've got a brand new V2 in N-scale. Certainly looks fantastic from the shots we've seen there, Gary. Can't wait to find out more. Yeah, we'll have a look at those in a minute, Richard. But before we do, shall we find out a bit more about the real things? Let's do. So we're here on the footplate of the Pioneer V2 class locomotive Green Arrow. And with me is Anthony Cools, the senior curator of the National Railway Museum. And hopefully Anthony's going to be able to tell us a little bit more about the V2 class in general. So Anthony, why did the LNER feel that they needed a locomotive of this particular type? Well, if you think about it, Gary, the evolution of the V2 goes back to 1923 and the grouping where you see the formation of the London North Eastern Railway. And they inherit an eclectic mix of locomotives from the Great Eastern Railway, North Eastern Railway, Great Central Railway, all those other you know, constituents. So there's no consistent locomotive design. The chief engineer of the LNER is Nigel Gresley later Sir Nigel Gresley, and he's already begun to prove the success of some of these modern innovations of locomotives in things like the A1 design and the K3 moguls, the 260s. You know, you, you want to improve on those, but you've also got to go with the services that you need to operate as well. So, you know, we hear a lot about you know, the, 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 caliber, the high caliber, prestigious railway flying Scotsman, Tynetees, Pullman, all those sort of services. But actually by the 30s, you're trying to do the same with your goods traffic, your freight business, that you need to distribute stuff fast. You need to make sure that it gets to destinations as quickly as possible. So by the mid 1930s, uh, the LNER have got this freight service, the, the Green Arrow. You know, there is a precedent in naming your locomotive after the train service, Flying Scotsman, named after Flying Scotsman, the train service. Green Arrow, named after the Green Arrow freight service, which was a fast fitted goods train. So pretty much the DHL of its time, but you need a reliable engine to run that. And initially, Gresley and team had talked about making a version of the P2, you know, the big two yeah. twos, Cock of the North and its sisters. But actually by the time the V2 is in development, they're looking at something that 
is more akin to a Sawn-Off A1 Pacific or yes. A3. So what we have with the V2 is in essence the best bits of Gresley. It's like Gresley's greatest hits rolled together in a locomotive. So it's a 262 wheel arrangement. So there's a pony truck at the front to guide it through curves and crossings, etc. Six six foot two driving wheels. So they're able to put down power, but they're also able to run fast. Yeah. V2s could, were clocked up to certainly the 90s. And I think there was at least one occasion where one was, uh, was measured about 101 miles an hour. Um, but say so the, the main thing is they can run Pretty fast goods trains. And then, so 262, trailing pair of wheels under the cab here, under the firebox as a pony truck. So it enables you to have this wide, effective, steam producing firebox. At the front end of the engine, also the cylinders, um, a monoblock casting designed there for the ease of construction and maintenance. Uh, rather than having three separate cylinders with the different stresses that those could set up on the, on the frames as they were on a A1s and A3s. Yes. You've got a single monoblock, so a three-cylinder engine with two sets of outside valve shafts, valve gear, driving the valves on the middle engine through a combination lever with the uh, the uh, Holcroft conjugated valve gear. So you know, three cylinders. This engine has acceleration, it has power, it has speed. Little nice little touch that uh, you'll see on, on the engine on the outside, and I know that you've captured on the model is it has the slope front to the cab, which yes. was. A feature of Gresley's A4. So whilst it's not a streamlined engine per se, it's got that nice little taper. To also the employed the on the P2, wasn't it? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know you don't get it on an A3, but this, this that, that sort of marks out the V2 as a bit of a racing machine to me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, five of these initially built prove their worth, and Ellen now said, right, okay, we'll have another 179 of these. Mm. So they built uh, until 1944 both here in uh, Doncaster and at Darlington. Now you mentioned being built till 1944. Now, yeah. they were allowed to be built during the war years, they weren't were. they being a mixed traffic locomotive? Um, but these had a reputation, didn't they? They earned a bit of a nickname as the engines that won the war during the Second World War. Why was that? Well, there's numerous engines you could always say won the war, and I've heard it said about the Austerity 280s as well. But uh, in real terms, you know, War is about moving people as much as it is about moving goods and munitions. And V2s were regularly, from 1939, pulling trains of 20 plus coaches. And there is that record that's noted of uh, one of the class members in 1940 pulling 26 coaches, 804 tonnes, unassisted from Peterborough to London wow. in a reasonable speed, I think about 90 minutes, I think it was. But you know, you think about that, fitting in with the rest of the traffic of the railway, you know, they're needing to move people, they're needing to move goods and munitions. The, the V2's ability to move massive amounts, because you think about a normal service train, okay, it's not 10 coaches, it's maybe 10, 12, 13, 20 at a time. That's, that really is an epic achievement, not just for the machine itself, but of course for the guys who were main, not maintaining it, but operating it, driver and fireman. I would imagine with 26, bogey coaches behind the tender, the driver is sort of, well he's glued to it, but the fireman he never gets to sit down over there at all, he's no. head down, backside up and he's bailing all the time. But if the engine wasn't so good it wouldn't have done that. No. You know, you don't hear about Jubilees doing it, you don't hear about Castles doing it, but the V2, you know, they have got that popular phrase of the engine that won the war. Yeah. And whilst that might be a little bit far-fetched looking at it now, certainly they made a massive contribution, I think, to transport in yeah. the conflict. But that turn of speed, that fast acceleration they had, uh, they found favour on routes like the Great Central Main Line yeah, as well, of didn't they? The Great Central Railway designed to be an intercity railway from, mm. from the outset. Double track, fast services, and that's again where the V2s found their niche. You know, you'd still got the Pacifics working on the East Coast Main Line, but the V2s, they're working out of Marleyman up to Sheffield, they're going through Leicester. And you see you know, those classic pictures from Colin Walker from the 60s, yes. you know, mainline meant the last days of the Great Central Railway. The V2 is there all the time, isn't it? Yeah. So into BR era, the monoblock casting began to find problems with it, they didn't did, they? They did, they did, because whilst it's a really great technological innovation, you're only as good as the, the techniques that you have at the time for manufacture and repair. So there were flaws in the castings that began to show up, cracks began to, to, to open up, and of course steam escapes through the cracks, it makes the engine less efficient, makes your vision from the front of the engine not so good because you're getting clouds of steam in your way all the time. And so um, British Railways began a programme of replacing the monoblock 
cylinder casting with three separate cylinders, pretty much as an A3 would have. Mm. Uh, so, you know, two outside separate cylinders and a single one. And I think it was about 79 of the V2s were so treated by the end of, end of steam, of course. So, in your opinion then, the V2, a worthy model for the Graham Farish and scale range, would you say? Very much so, and I should imagine that knowing you and your team, it will perform as good as the real thing, do you? <laughs> It's nice of you to say so. Thanks very much, Anthony. You're very welcome. Right, we'll go and have a look at the models then, shall we? So Anthony's now told us quite a bit more about the real things, Richard, and I'm sure you'll agree that we've captured as many of those details and things that make the V2 so special into our new model which I think is fair to say is a bit of a masterpiece in miniature. I totally agree, Gary. I mean, the model itself is constructed from a highly detailed injection molded body shell and the tender body as well. That's running on a die cast chassis, so it's got a lot of weight for the, the running performance. Uh, onto the body, we've fitted lots of separately fitted metal handrails alongside the boiler around the cab area, and that extends to the, the tender as well, even the little grab handle for the, the rear steps there. And we've got turned metal buffers at each end of the model, there's even the etched fillets at the front of the running plate there. There's separate lubricators alongside the running plate. Uh, we've also got inside the cab a detailed cab interior, right. which is going to be decorated, of course, accordingly to the prototype when we come to the livery application. Uh, there's even a driver and fireman seat, whether the fireman in particular got much chance to use <laughs> it. Quite. Probably not from what Anthony was saying. Um, we've also got a hinged posable full plate between the locomotive and tender um, and all that provides a, a wonderful character which I'm sure you agree captures the essence of the prototype. But what about the technical specification, Gary? Well, they've been made to the same high standards as people have come to expect now from the Graham Farish range. So, coreless motor for a start. We've got electrical pickup on all driving wheels and all tender wheels. There's individual metal brass bearings in the tender uh, Next18 decoder socket because we do have sound and non-sound. So there's a sugar cube speaker in each one. And that's fitted to every model? Yes, as standard. Wonderful. And I noticed the drawbar between the locomotive and tender, which gives you that fixed coupling, takes the power between the two parts of the model. Uh, that's very nicely modelled and, and quite discreet as well. Absolutely, yes. Wonderful. So we also get the option of a traction tyred wheel set for those looking for additional haulage. We do, that comes in the accessory pack. And that balances off against extra electrical pickup, yep. obviously with pickup coming from all the tender wheels and the other locomotive driving wheels and people can really make their choice and uh, take what suits their, their layout and their requirements. Absolutely. Wonderful. So obviously this is a specification that covers the whole range of Graham Farish V2 class locomotives. Yes. But we do have some tooling options as well, don't we? Yes, we do. Beginning with the V2's distinctive Gresley smoke box, a new tooling covers both the l &ER and British Railways eras. From the l &ER's plain smoke box door with lower position lamp iron, to the BR style door complete with smoke box number plate and higher positioned lamp iron. Below the door, the buffer beam comes with turned brass buffers, while a separate coupling hook, coupling bash plate and guard irons are provided in the accessory pack. Moving to the side of the locomotives, the most noticeable tooling variations on the models centre on the cylinders. Here we have captured the detail of the V2's monoblock cylinder casting, which also formed the smoke box saddle and had noticeably different steam pipe outlines on either side of the locomotive. The tooling suite also covers those locomotives that were rebuilt with three separate cylinders, easily identifiable because of the large outside steam pipes. Staying with the cylinders, the two versions of the rocker arm guides for the Gresley conjugated valve gear have been captured too on the front of the castings as number 4771 to 4775 were different to the rest of the class. Optional drain cocks are provided in the accessory pack. Along the high running plate, separately fitted mechanical lubricators are provided, while on top of the boiler the Gresley Banjo Dome is also present before we reach the prominent V-fronted cab. A detailed cab interior includes a moulded firebox backhead and seats for the driver and fireman, and a cab roof fence are shown in an open position. Optional cab doors come in the accessory pack, while an etched brass full plate leads us neatly into the tender. The new V2s are provided with three variations of the l &ER standard 4,200 gallon flush sided tender. These include the earlier type with deep cutout at the front and a low front coal plate, plus two versions of the shallow cutout examples. Of these, one has a high front and high rear coal plate, with the rear plate being forward of the water scoop dome. The other version has a high front coal plate and low rear, the rear plate being further back to sit astride the scoop dome. 
As at the front, turn brass buffers are provided on the tenders, and separate dummy coupling hook, which can be fitted to the buffer beam, is provided in the accessory pack. A notable feature of the V2s was that, of the 184 locomotives built, only 8 were ever named. Seven of these carried curved nameplates on the running plate, despite having no splashes to mount them on. The one exception was Green Arrow, which carried its name on a straight nameplate on either side of the smoke box. Both nameplate styles are included in the new V2 tooling suite. Well, we've had a cracking day out here at the Danum Art Gallery, Museum and Library in Doncaster. I would like to thank Anthony Cools and Gary Boyd Hope for joining me and telling us all about the brand new Graham Farish V2 class locomotives and the history of the real locomotives as well. These guys might be waiting a while for the next train to arrive, but you can look forward to the awesome British Railway announcements on the 7th of August, where we'll be revealing the all new V2 class in all its glory, giving you the liveries, pricing and delivery information. Until then, please subscribe to our newsletter for all the latest news and arrivals from Batman Europe. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and get notifications of our next videos. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.